morning since 1979. I've been a lawyer in Oregon, and I a lot of times feel like uh, lawyers and police officers and uh, uh, emergency personnel clean up the mess after car wrecks. And I pretty much in 1982 decided that I was going to focus my law practice and my whole, my whole career, I've been doing this now for 36 years, to traffic law. So I, I'm a traffic law specialist. I'm a student of it. I've learned a lot from police officers. I work closely with police officers because when I go to court, um, usually the police officers are on our side. I don't do criminal defense. I haven't for decades. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm a plaintiff lawyer, so um, I'm trying to have law enforcement help uh, in presenting a case where somebody got hurt. And so um, I'm, I'm, pretty well, I'm pretty well experienced. I wrote a book about pedestrian law. Each of you have it in front of you. It's a green book. Um, and I wrote a, another book about bicycle law in Oregon, and it's an orange book, and it's now in its eighth printing. But I have tried to improve the law, and I've been spending a lot of time at the legislature, and I can tell you at the legislature, when we're trying to improve the traffic laws so that the rules um, uh, on the street uh, make sense in the court, um, having police officers who uh, combine with citizens to present evidence about a need for a law to the legislators goes a whole lot further. They see me and they think, oh boy, here comes Ray again. You know, but <laughs> he was only here just a year ago, for God's sake. So it really helps me to be able to, to work with law enforcement people and it's at uh, presentations like this that I really do get to learn about where, where are the rules of the game not making sense. What I tell people is, you know, if you're, if you're a cop, um, if you have an understanding of what the history of the law is, what the text of the law is, you feel that you understand it, it makes it a whole lot easier to enforce it. And when somebody challenges you on a, a decision to give a citation, it helps if you can do something more than just say, I don't know, it just came out of the legislature, it doesn't make a darn bit of sense to me either. And uh, my, the goal in my career has to make, been to make it so that police officers um, prosecutors and judges can look at the traffic law and say, yeah, it's not perfect, but it's pretty darn good. And I'll tell you, after doing this for three decades, our Oregon law, in terms of its development, has been a leader in the nation for certain things. And uh, some of these laws um, I'm, I'm not even going to talk about, but the Oregon passing law and the pedestrian law and the vulnerable user, the VRU careless, are looked upon by people in other jurisdictions where law enforcement folks are frustrated because the laws by and large in the traffic code, a lot of them were originally written in the 40s and they don't really apply to the kind of multi-use roadway systems that our state departments of transportation are trying to put. And for all of you, you know, I mean, you're traffic cops, you know if you were to take a photo or a, a, a snapshot of what the roadways looked like 10 years ago in your county, your district, your precinct, um, they've really changed. You know, rural two-lane blacktops, what they've done is they've made it so that we've got widened shoulders to encourage people uh, to use the shoulders. These shared, these shared roads are in some ways on the good side. It's encouraging people to, to ride their bikes and to walk alongside the roadways. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's, it's led to people being in a position where you've got uh, roadway users who kind of feel like, oh yeah, well, now we got a wide shoulder. They go out there on their bicycles and they fail, they fail to realize, you know, they're within a, a couple of feet of vehicles where the closing speed is such, you know, you're talking 40, 50 miles an hour closing speed differential. And in, in your work and in my work, the level of the high energy transfers that we see in traumatic cases, I mean, I just shake my head. And you know, in the old days, a lot of times the cops in the emergency room people used to say to me when I'd come and talk to them about something, they said, well, what the hell did you think was gonna happen? You know, you got all these people out there and they're having a nice day and they're out there on their little bike on the side of a two lane road where people are going 65 miles an hour. Well, what do you think is gonna happen if somebody sneezes or has a seizure or a diabetic? doesn't realize that they're getting a little bit woozy and they turn the wheel an eighth of a turn to the right, you know, I mean, you can't really change reality. Well, and that's true, but what I've tried to do is to say, okay, look, in the old days, 
before the 40s and 50s when subdivisions started to be developed where there were no sidewalks anymore, which is what happened in 50s and 60s. Um, before then, the, the roads used to be considered a public way. I mean, there were people walking, there were people with farm equipment, and uh, then when we started to restrict the roadways and make them these, you know, really narrow high-speed corridors, um, what happened is that uh, we kind of had to do some changes to make the roadways be more accommodating to people. And of course, ODOT somewhat leading the charge. Some of us would like to see ODOT be a little bit more proactive in some ways. Um, and others of us, like for example, cops who have to enforce bike lane laws, kind of wonder, well, to what extent is the solution creating part of the problem here? And uh, I hear that all the time, and I teach it, and I'm a promoter of it, but I also recognize, you know, we've had a lot of ideas and a lot of changes that you're going to see in the way your city engineering departments change the traffic system in your cities and counties. What I like to say is some of those are good ideas. Some of them are not such good ideas, but where they have the force and effect of law, then you're charged with enforcing them. And what I want to do today is to kind of give you a little bit of a legal background so that you can at least, at least I did what I could to let you know a little bit about our pedestrian laws. So where I'd like to start is the book that I've uh, got that I handed out to everybody is this one. And it, it, it contains articles and laws, not only ORS but OARs and uh, municipal ordinances that you can take with you and use as references. Because as you know, the ORSs, the OARs, and the municipal laws comprise a patchwork, some of which is um, overlapping. It's not supposed to be inconsistent, but sometimes it's not, it doesn't knit together very well. And uh, that's the basis from which that we take our laws. And so what I want to do is to provide this resource to you. And if you like, you know, the, I mean, the articles that I've written about the history of pedestrian law in Oregon are contained in there. You can get into it as deep as you want. And if you ever want to work on legislative pedestrian issues, get a hold of me because I'm always looking for help. We can always improve the law. So what I'd like to have you do, if you don't mind, is I also gave you two articles. And um, the first one is uh, called, What are the Limits of the Pedestrian Right-of-Way on the, the Crosswalk in Oregon? And this one, right on the front of it, contains the, the section in ORS 811.028, which is the new paragraph 4. It, it, it went into effect in 2011. This is the addition to the crosswalk law where when you do an enforcement action, a pedestrian doesn't have to be out in the killing zone so that you can do an enforcement for a motorist uh, violating the pedestrian crosswalk law. So I want to talk about how did, how did we get to having this law where a person can take a foot or a, a bike wheel or a cane tip and put it into the road. And let me just give you a, a tiny bit of background on it. In 05, in Oregon, ORS 811.028 needed to be changed because bike laws had come along. And what the pedestrian law before then had provided was that a pedestrian in a marked or an unmarked crosswalk, and for those of you, I'm sure you know this, but a marked crosswalk and an unmarked crosswalk have the same force and effect in Oregon law, unmarked or marked. And in my book, I've got the ORS definition of what a crosswalk is. I will tell you, every time I get a pedestrian case that involves a crosswalk, and I'm trying to make sure that the person was in the crosswalk, I got to do the same thing every single time, even though I've been doing this um, for decades, and that is, I've got to go and look up the definition of a crosswalk. And the reason for it is, is that for you all, if you're ever in a position where you're having to go to court, you really have to be able to know what is the crosswalk. And the source of the crosswalk is contained on page 104 in the book. And in this book, what I did was, you'll see this, these, are the, these are the text of the laws. It's, it's not like easy speak. It's the actual text 
text of the ORS. I put these gray boxes that you'll see in some of the pages in there. Those are parentheticals, heads up from me that I'm giving to you about, hey, look, this is what I think is important about this particular law. So that's me talking to you. And what you'll see is that the definition of a crosswalk goes on for several paragraphs and it's quite technical. It can be up to 20 feet wide. And when I see somebody who gets hit, I go to the place and I get this thing out and I parse through it. And you think, you know, God, you know, you know, I know it pretty well, but you have to really know from where does the crosswalk definition come. And here it is. This is the, this is the fountainhead of our Oregon crosswalk. And you know what people say to me is, well, uh, you know, if you get through the legal gobbledygook, I mean, how do I know where the unmarked crosswalk is, right? Because a lot of, you know, in the neighborhood four-corner intersection, there's no paint on the road. And I say, well, I'll tell you, if you want to know where a typical unmarked crosswalk is in a four-corner intersection in some residential area, it's extending the sidewalks. If you were to give a 12-year-old a spray can and say, all right, extend the sidewalks and paint crosswalk marks, that pretty much would be where the crosswalk is. And that's where the unmarked crosswalk is. You just basically extend the sidewalks. Um, however, where it's a marked crosswalk, that trumps the, what might be a, an unmarked crosswalk definition because that provides you with your parameters. And I'm assuming every single pedestrian crosswalk action you do, it's always involving a crosswalk that's marked, isn't it? Anybody ever do an unmarked crosswalk enforcement action? No, I don't think so. But the fact of the matter is, in some states, unmarked crosswalks aren't crosswalks. And in fact, you've got to be really careful, and I'm not going to point any fingers, but when you look at your municipal ordinances of what's a crosswalk and what's you know, what the municipal ordinance covers. Some of them only say uh, mark crosswalks. I know that that's a, a typo, but just check and make sure. But in Oregon, they both have the same force and effect of law. So what, has, what happened was ORS 811.028 pre-2006 um, didn't take bike lanes into account. So the legislature decided it needed to do something about that. So if you go to um, the, the, the version of 811.028 in the book, and it's on page 107. Um, just take a look at it, and what you'll see is that in 06, what the legislature did was they changed the law to take into account corners where there's a traffic control device and a bike lane. And so it's pretty simple to, I think, visualize and here's the, the, the way that I say it is, look, if it's a f an intersection where there's no traffic control device, what a pedestrian gets is two lanes. Two lanes of right of way, right? So the crudest intersection, the crudest unmarked crosswalk or marked crosswalk without a traffic control device, the pedestrian gets, two, gets to cross two lanes make the traffic stop and give the right of way to them in both directions. Once they step off that corner, traffic has to stop in both directions of a typical two-lane roadway. But where there is a traffic control device, now you've got a higher use, a more regulated intersection, and the pedestrian is given less space because they've got electronic assistance from the traffic control device. Then what, you tr what became into reality in 06 was what I call the lane and six foot rule. Pedestrians, when they're walking with a walk, get a lane plus six feet. That's what they get. They don't get two lanes, they get a lane plus six feet. And that's what happened in 06 to change and became what is on page 107 and 108, the new ORS 811.028. Here's the problem. It's really long. It's got those two different variants to it, which, uh, unless you like to read about the law, most people kind of tune out by the time they get through it all. And here was the biggest problem, and this is what I saw. When did cops give people a ticket for violating 811.028. Usually when somebody got tagged, 
and hit, which is too late, unfortunately. Somebody gets hurt, run down by somebody, and then obviously the driver failed to yield the right of way to a pedestrian in the crosswalk because there's the, there's the point of impact. And then the other thing was they had to see something that was really egregious. Some kids walking to school halfway across the lane and then some guy in a Subaru going 40 miles an hour just completely blows by them and treats them like a traffic pylon. Well, that's an easy one. The problem was, how does a parent who's, let's say, we got this safe routes to school stuff we're trying to do, people are saying kids should walk to school, not be delivered by their parents, you know? Well, how do you teach your kid to safely cross the neighborhood streets on the way to school? How can you make the car stop? I'm not gonna teach my kid to walk out, uh, let's see, to trigger 811.028, I gotta be crossing the roadway in a crosswalk, right? Well then, how do I keep, make the car stop before my kid crosses? Well, you, I mean, there's no trigger. There's no trigger to make the car stop. So we were trying to figure out how to do it. First, we look at the blind law. The blind law says if somebody's blind, got a cane or a, a, a dog, they get the right of way when they're crossing or when they're about to cross in a crosswalk, right? It's additional level of, 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 uh, of protection. So that means somebody standing on a curb with, with a blind cane is entitled to the right of way and approaching drivers have to stop. Well, but that, there's no politics with that for regular people. That didn't fly. We talked to legislators, said no way. Then we tried, and you may have heard about this in like, I don't know, it was about 08. We tried a hand signal, because traffic patrol people, remember what they do, they can put up their hand, it's a traffic control device. That's how patrol boys and girls do it. They stop the cars that way. Well, that really worked, but the politics, it didn't have legs. We failed in two different legislatures. People were laughing about, it. oh yeah, everybody's gonna hold their hand up like they're getting called on to make the car stop. Well, okay, so that didn't work. So then what we figured out was, you know what we need is we need a legal trigger to make the car stop. So what can we do without, how can we make the car stop without stepping out into the killing zone? Right, because that's what it is. <laughs> So what we realized was 811.028 already says that you get two lanes or a lane and six if there's a device. What you really need is you need to make the car stop not where there's a traffic control device, but an intersection that's non-signalized. And what can we teach the kids? What can we give the old people? What can we have people learn about? And what we realized was if you could have somebody be able to make the car stop so that they don't have to get out in front where the cars are gonna run them down, and that two lanes of travel, cars in two, two directions have to stop once somebody's in a crosswalk crossing. We could make it so that if you got a cane tip, if you got a wheelchair wheel, if you got a bike, if you got a stroller, if you've got anything attached to your body that you take off that curb and put into the water or into the, into the roadway, like somebody testing the water with their toe before they jump in, if you stand on, you step off that curb and there's cars coming, and they don't stop, and a law enforcement officer sees that going on, that's a violation of 811.028. And not only does it give an enforcement technique for cops, it also takes away excuses for saying, well, shoot, I don't know what the, what's the length and breadth of the law? I mean, what's a safe pass? You know, like somebody, it's, it's kind of in the eye of the beholder. Well, it's no longer in the eye of the beholder. If, the, if it's a crosswalk marked or unmarked, and the pedestrian has indicated their intent to cross with an extension of their body, and we specifically go into it, cane tip, wheelchair wheel, bike tire, anything, then the cars are required to stop. And once the cars are stopped, and if the kids learn this, and the old people learn this, or you all learn this, once the car stopped by you doing that, now you can cross. It's not to say that somebody's not gonna step on the gas and run you down, but goodness gracious, the fact of the matter is, is that the chances of that happening are so much lesser than you stepping out into the killing zone instead of the tr in front of approaching cars, figuring, oh, they're far enough back, they got plenty of time to see me and stop, with disastrous consequences. And since we changed that law in 2010, it was signed by the governor in 2011, we had law enforcement officers saying, this is what we need to enforce this law. We had elders and school people coming behind it. 
We had really nobody opposing it, and it's been the law since 2011, and it's the basis upon which you all do your pedestrian enforcement in Oregon. So that's the, that's the legal trigger. And uh, the nice thing about it is, is that it's being copied in other states too, because they've got the same problem. You say you got the right of way in the crosswalk, but how do you make the car stop? How do you know when somebody violated? And so I wrote an article about, and I put it in front of you there, um, about, about how it was that the law came to be and also what the limits are. And I hope that this little bit of background is, is, is helpful for you in, in seeing how it was that we came to do this. And uh, I'll tell you, in my cases, it sure does make it easier because the law is so much more, uh, so much more clear. So now what I want to do is to talk to you for about, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes about what are the limits to the pedestrian right-of-way, because there are limits. Well, I've already told you, first of all, outside the crosswalk, right? And an unmarked crosswalk, if, if, if somebody gets hit in an unmarked crosswalk, where you got to go every time is you got to go to that definition. Who knew in this room that a crosswalk could be up to 20 feet wide? There you go. I mean, that is, was news to me. I thought, whoa, 20 feet wide, no kidding. So, so there's the first part. The other one is uh, something that a lot of pedestrian advocates don't like to know about. And, uh, but, it's, it's, but it's really important, and it's on page 21. 814040. Um, if you look at uh, 1A, suddenly leaving a curb or another place of safety and moving into the path of a vehicle that's so close as to constitute an immediate hazard. That's familiar language, isn't it? Because that language is used in the traffic code in other places. But this is the limit of the pedestrian right of way because the fact of the matter is you don't have a right of way if you step out in front of a car that's 10 feet away from the from the crosswalk, it makes it impossible for them to use their 1.5, 1.6 second reaction time, get on the brakes and stop the car. This is the counterbalance to the pedestrian right of way. And let me tell you, in my world, somebody gets hit, it seems clear to me when I analyze with my accident reconstructionist what happened, and almost every time that happens, what I end up doing once the insurance company gets involved is I'm dealing with what they call the urban deer phenomenon. This pedestrian tried to commit suicide by stepping out in front of this car that was right on top of him. And that's where the, the push and play, the big tug is in a lot of my pedestrian impact cases. It's just how close was the car? Where was the car when the pedestrian stepped? What's the speed and distance analysis over and over again? And it's this law that is the t pivot point around the pedestrian right of way. And that's why when you all do these target enforcement actions, you've got your distances on when it is that you have the legal trigger for allowing a, a conviction to occur for a, for a driver. You, and you give them the benefit of the doubt. And in fact, if you look on page 23, we just put that chart in there because I got it from the old ODOT enforcement manuals, what it does, of course, it gives the benefit of every doubt to a motorist who's trying to, who's trying to slow down and stop. So the, the closeness of the vehicle is one of the outer limits. The width, of, the size of the crosswalk, where they are, is another one. Another one um, is page 115, 814.010, the appropriate response to traffic control devices, and then what people actually get, the, the, the uh, the ticket for is on the following page, uh, ORS 814.020. The point of it is that what has happened in our society as we've promoted bicycling and pedestrian and non-motorized use to the roadway, we have s created a sense of entitlement by pedestrians to cross against the law, to go and start crossing after the don't walk has already started flashing. Do I do it? I confess. I do it all the time if I think I can get away with it and I'm in a hurry. But the fact is, is once that no crossing starts flashing, it's over. You can't step off the curb and start crossing and think that you've got anything other than you're committing a traffic violation. And what I tell people is, if you get whacked when you do that, good luck. because. 
I go to juries and I start talking about how somebody ran somebody down when they were crossing against the don't walk, and people are like, everybody thinks about all these pedestrians who are crossing in front of them against the light, and it's like chaos on the streets. People don't, at least where I live, a lot of people don't come downtown to Portland because they don't want to deal with the pedestrians and the bicyclists who are in dark clothes, crossing against the light, riding bikes without lights at night. It's like uh, ruination <laughs> of, our, of our street life. So for pedestrians to be made aware of the fact that it really is a violation of the law to cross against adult walk is maybe not such a bad thing. What are pedestrians allowed to do if they're halfway across and the don't walk starts flashing? They can finish crossing to the other side. The don't walk coming on while you're crossing in the crosswalk is like the yellow light coming on as you're going through the intersection. You can continue. You don't have to go back. Well, not that anybody does. Um, but the fact is, is that uh, the, the law is very clear. And in my view, if you wanted to improve the harmony between drivers and pedestrians, it would be very nice if pedestrians could follow the traffic law. The pedestrians want the motorists to follow the traffic law when it's in the pedestrian's favor, but when it's against their, if they're, and, and I'll tell you what you can do. If you were to do a study of the population demographics in various intersections in the state of Oregon, I will tell you, in my opinion, that the more people within the a uh, pro uh, quarter mile proximity to the intersection that w live and work there, the more likely it is that the pedestrians are going to violate the don't walk, walk. You go to a small town or a little rural <coughs> area, the, the pedestrians follow the law. There's a reason for that. You go down into a city place or sometimes like on the campuses, it's like, <laughs> wait a minute, you people are going to college to learn about stuff. Well, what about, what about knowing about the basics of the law. And besides that, not only is it illegal, but it's dangerous. All right, so I, I leave that to you. The, uh, the next thing is municipal laws. I referenced that. Um, I've got a section in the book, and it starts in, uh, I mean, I'll just show you an example of it in, on page 128. The whole section begins on 127. What I did was I took a lot of the little towns and cities in Oregon, and I looked up all the pedestrian laws, and I gave you a smattering of them. And if you look at the Portland one, if you look at, uh, oh, I don't know, where's, I, I thought maybe Scapoose would be something to also look at. That's on page 128. What you'll see is that, okay, look, there's state laws, OARs, and ORSs, but then there's municipal laws. And many of the municipal laws, and if you take a look at, 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 at several of these, you'll see they prohibit crossing the road within a hundred feet of a crosswalk. Now, I could tell you that if you have a city where you work that has that municipal ordinance, I would suggest before you give somebody a ticket for violating it that you check with your city attorney's office first. And I'll tell you why. As a lawyer, I've got a question about the constitutionality of such a law. It's nowhere in the traffic code. It's only in certain places. There's a good social policy for it. Why do you want people to go up to a crosswalk when there's a, when there's a crosswalk within 150 feet instead of walking across the, the street otherwise? Well, it's because it's a, whole lot, it's a whole lot more safe. But there's another reason for it, and that's this. I learned in 1994 when I represented an ODOT worker down in Eugene who saw a piece of oak that had fallen off a, tra a trailer and was in the highway and picked it up and started to walk with it over to the shoulder, big one, weighed about 20 pounds, a truck came and saw him and guessed that when that guy picked that piece of oak up, he was going to carry it to the median in the middle. But instead, my, the guy was going to the shoulder with it. So the truck driver didn't even slow down and, and just st steered to the right. And of course, the ODOT guy picked it up and went this way. And he got hit going about 50 miles an hour, hit, broke just about every bone on the side of his body somehow. Um, I don't know how, 
but he, he, he lived. And I represented him. And I go into court, and the insurance company for the truck driver says, yeah, I know, you know, we did, they did their little dance, and, you know, the, the, my guy, my truck driver, guessed wrong. Sorry about your guy. But the fact is, did you know that your guy, highway worker, has to yield the right of way to vehicle traffic unless he's on a sidewalk or in the crosswalk? In other words, your guy failed to yield the right of way to the truck. And I thought, well, shit. I looked at the law, I couldn't believe it. So we went to, that tri we went to trial in that case down in Roseburg. Got, I won, I don't even know how. The jury said my guy was 49.9% at fault. The next year took my guy to the legislature and we established for the first time in Oregon the highway worker exception to the crosswalk law. If you're a highway worker and you're in a work zone, you've got the right of way. And that changed the law, and that's, that's the current law that we got. And so the point of that is, is that the, the traffic law for the pedestrian who's not crossing the roadway in a crosswalk is that the pedestrian has to yield the right of way to motor vehicles. Yielding the right of way to motor vehicles means don't get in a position where you're in the killing zone. If you get hit outside the crosswalk, it's going to be, I mean, cops generally do not cite pedestrians for violating this law. But the fact of the matter is that in my world, where we're cleaning up the mess with the insurance, it always goes against the pedestrian because they weren't in a crosswalk. They weren't in the safe zone. They were, they were illegal. And furthermore, if you are in a position where not you're crossing the law, crossing the road, but where you're walking along the road, I got a case right now. I mean, I just see them all the time. In fact, I've gotten to the point where I pull over if I see somebody violating this one. Um, ORS 814.070 on page 117 of the book is improper position on the highway. So you're not in a crosswalk, you're not on a sidewalk, and you've got to walk along the roadway. You must walk facing the traffic as far off the traveled portion of the roadway as possible. I've had, unfortunately, so many cases, and I see so many times these otherwise smart people walking with the traffic. Sometimes they've got their little flashers going, you know, going for their little morning walk, and they're walking with the traffic, and they're paying attention, and I, and I tell them, you know, look, I represent a girl who was walking home after work, trying to avoid a puddle on the other side. Some lady, also going to work, failed to see her, ran her down, and the cop who investigated this fatal said to me, look, I would not give your dead lady a citation out of respect for her and her parents. But the fact of the matter is, the law says that if you don't walk facing traffic, you're in violation of the law. You've got to walk facing traffic. And, uh, you know, I mean, the problem in my world is, as a lawyer, when you're in the negligence world, you've got to be at least uh, in a position where the driver who hit you was mostly at fault. If you, as a pedestrian who got hit, are 51% at fault, you completely lose. And so if you violate a statute, such as uh, trying to ex assert your right of way, when a car is so close to constitute an immediate hazard in violation of statute, you, you're, you're done. I mean, you're not going to get any wage loss. You're not going to get any medicals. You're not going to have a civil case. And uh, in my world, I mean, that, <laughs> that's kind of the end of what a lawyer can do for you. There's nothing much I can do. So the improper position is, 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 a, big, is a big problem. So those I, are what I would suggest to you, that little collection, uh, that little bundle of laws, those are the limitations on the pedestrian right-of-way on the road and in the crosswalk. Now I want to talk to you for, about a f for a few minutes about some common sense laws against dangerous practices. And by dangerous practices, um, I mean things that, unfortunately, a lot of motorists don't know anything about. And I don't know how they managed to get through driver's ed. I guess that's a negative on uh, our highway and driver education programs. But, um, and I, I learned a few of these from cops. Um, the first one is the, is the failure to stop when, emerge, when emerging from an alley, a driveway, or a building. 
um, on page 111, this is it, it's ORS 811.505. This one's almost universally uh, ignored by drivers, but it says that a driver's got to come to a full and complete stop before they cross a sidewalk. It doesn't matter if you've got a big, nice car, doesn't matter if you've got a full bladder, doesn't matter if you just went shopping at the Fred Meyer store and the ice cream's melting in the back seat, it doesn't matter you got to stop before you cross that sidewalk. And if more drivers did that, and if, incidentally, if more cops gave tickets for violations of that, I think we'd have fewer pedestrians picked off on sidewalks, walking in front of parking lot exits, walking in front of driveways, and trying to walk in front of uh, alleys. Because bear in mind, a pedestrian has the right of way on a sidewalk, whether it's in front of an uh, alley or whether it's in front of a driveway or uh, any type of a private roadway. And let me just say one thing to you about bicycles. I almost hate to tell you this, but bicycles have a speed limit in crosswalks. Uh, bicycles are pedestrians for purposes of crosswalks. They get the right-of-way, but they got a speed limit. And the reason for it is, I, I say it this way, look, if you go for a walk with your daughter on her skateboard, you're on your bike, your son is jogging, and your cousin is pushing her jog stroller, and you're all out going along the sidewalk, and you get to a crosswalk, well, you on your bicycle could blow all them away in a speed contest. But if you go in, in that crosswalk and expect to have the right of way, you can go no faster than a walking speed as you enter that crosswalk. You can't go faster than a normal walking speed and retain your right of way. And the reason, and I tried to change this law twice in the legislature, they totally shot me down. They said, look, a bike can go 20 miles an hour. How can a driver anticipate a bike going 20 miles an hour entering a crosswalk, even with their with the walk? They're going too fast. They should anticipate somebody going at a walking speed. That's what crosswalks are designed to accommodate. Same thing for driveways, same thing for crossing in front of alleys. A bicyclist is allowed to go on the sidewalk unless it's prohibited by municipal ordinance. Traffic code allows it. They can go on the sidewalk, off the sidewalk, on, 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 off. Except in dense urban cores, many of cities in, in Oregon um, prohibit it. But if they're lawfully on the sidewalk, or crossing, the bicyclist must no, go no faster than a normal walking speed when they're expecting to claim the right of way. If there's no cars coming, they can go as fast as they want. Um, next one. Failing to yield right of way to the highway worker I told you about. That's RS 811.233. Uh, that's just something now that's basically part of our law. You've got to protect those highway workers. All of us do. The next one is um, on page 106, it's ORS 811.015. I don't know how often you see people blowing off uh, patrol guards for tr school zones, but they, patrol guards are traffic control devices. They are invested with all of the authority of the law. It's not just some little funny business Boy Scout deal. They have the force and authority of law. Next one, and this is on page 107, ORS 811. 0.020. This one is, is really important. You, in a vehicle, can't go by a vehicle, another vehicle that's crossed, that stopped for a pedestrian crossing in, 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 a, in a crosswalk. Bicyclists think they're immune from this. If you're on a, a, a roadway, two-lane roadway, it's got a bike lane in each direction on each side and two lanes of regular traffic, if a pedestrian steps off that cr cross in that crosswalk and steps off that curb and a car stops for him, bicyclists are required to do the same thing. The law is absolutely clear. And, and motor vehicles, um, you know, I mean, it's a terrible hazard where you see somebody stopping for somebody in a crosswalk and then another car comes along and says, oh, crap, and goes around him. And if you're ever in a position where you're a pedestrian and you think everything's fine, everybody stopped, and then all of a sudden this car comes by at 20 miles an hour, treats you like you're a traffic pylon, if you ever see anybody doing it, um, they, they, they need it. They need a good ticket. And, uh, to, you know, and the law is good that way. ORS 811.020 is, is, is the one to use. And then the other one is 
everybody's really clear about uh, the law for, uh, you know, for school buses, and those are pretty well followed. But there's another one for um, ORS 811.165 uh, on page 109 of the book. Yeah, that's passenger loading of a public transit vehicle. Um, people really have to give the right of way to allow that to, to allow that to happen, and uh, the law is real clear on that. If you were to do a survey of the people who get ticketed for this, it 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 is probably one of the least popular. Uh, public safety programs out there from the driver perspective. And I can tell you that um, the Portland traffic and um, Mike Morrison, tra trauma nurses, uh, and uh, uh, a number of other folks have teamed up to have a, 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 sh a share the road safety program as a diversion program for drivers who are first offenders who commit violations of this uh, law 811.028 as well as bicyclists who s think that somehow uh, when they were born they had to follow different rules from the rest of us which I haven't been able to figure out and what they do they come in they go into the amphitheater at, uh, at uh, Manual Hospital with ha which happens to be a trauma center and they hear a cop they hear a, a nurse and they hear a judge or a lawyer come in and tell them about what the law is and give them some materials and then at the end of the night if they successfully complete the thing they get a certificate and that certificate is a pass on what would otherwise be a traffic citation and uh, that's a very good program um, it's it goes a long way toward making drivers less grumpy and ODOT does have uh, uh, some money available for it but you got to get your chief or your upper administration and your police or your county department um, to want to uh, put something like it together. I can tell you there's a little bit of politics with the, uh, with the court system, but the fact of the matter is, is in, my, in my opinion, if you can give somebody a ticket and say, but if you take a safety class to learn about the law as it stands now, since it appears to me, sir, you probably took driver's ed 40 years ago <laughs> and we've had a whole bunch of new laws since then and this will give you a chance to kind of have a primer and by the way not only do you get to work off your ticket by getting this certificate what I found when I took the class you can send it into some insurance companies get five percent off your car insurance rates for two years just with the certificate from having gone through the diversion program so I mean that's pretty good and I would tell you this Whoever it was in the insurance business who decided that if somebody does take such a course and pass it, that they're going to give them a reduction in their insurance rates was a smart person because those drivers who go through that are a whole lot less likely to go out and get in a wreck that's going to cost uh, the insurance company money. It's a good investment and it makes it a little bit nice for you all because you're not giving somebody a ticket that they're going to be completely grumpy about. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>